Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Conor McNally. I'm the Communications Manager at Energy Futures Lab, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this week's uh, Energy Futures Lab lunchtime webinar. Um, this is the second week of our online series. Um, ordinarily, we run these uh, research seminars on campus, but uh, we've opened them up um, in this online format, and we'd love your, your feedback about how that's working. Uh, today, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Aaron Walsh from the Department of Materials. Aaron was trained in computational chemistry and physics at Trinity College Dublin. He has since held positions at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the United States, um, the University College London and the University of Bath. Uh, he joined the Department of Materials as a full professor in 2016, where he leads the materials design group. And he's going to speak today about computer accelerated materials design. Uh, before we get there, just a quick word about how the webinar will work. Aaron is going to speak for around about 30 minutes and then he'll take your questions. Uh, use the Q&A box on the right hand side of the screen to submit your questions and please put your name and your affiliation with those questions. Um, and I'd recommend holding off until Aaron has come close to the end of his presentation, excuse me, presentation um, to submit those questions just in case they are answered later on. So with that, I'll hand over now to Professor Aaron Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Connor, for the kind introduction. And thank you all for joining. Um, I hope you're staying safe and productive these days in unusual times. So my webinar is going to be um, covering computer accelerated materials design. And so first, just to introduce um, my research area. Um, so my group is focused on the theory and simulation of crystals. So materials that have an ordered structure. And generally what we're looking at is um, different excitations of crystals. So it could be electronic excitations, for example, in batteries, uh, vibrational excitations, for example, in thermoelectric materials, um, optical excitations in solar cells, and then increasingly um, using tools from statistics and machine learning to explore new chemical spaces. Um, so it's only a 30 minute webinar. So my aim is to give you a gentle introduction to the field and also some of the exciting changes that are happening that could benefit uh, energy technologies of relevance to the EFL. So I think one of the big motivating factors um, for my research is decreasing the technology timeline. So if you look at past technologies, um, it varies, but typically it takes two to three decades to translate from a materials discovery to actually having a commercial device. Um, so anything that we would discover now in the lab, it's, we're not going to see the results for many, many years. Um, so the question is, can we use the latest advances in theory, in computer simulations and statistics to reduce the barriers for um, each step of this process? So from materials identification, to synthesis, to scale up, to assembling devices, and finally to diagnostics. And I guess published studies are optimistic. They suggest that yes, um, computer simulations can help, and it's likely that we can de decrease the timeline by a factor of 10. So we could see in several years a materials discovery actually being brought to the marketplace. So that's where a lot of the excitement is. Um, my research is more, I guess, towards the um, initial side, so identifying new materials for particular applications. So almost every technology energy technology suffers from materials bottlenecks. So we don't have ideal batteries, we don't have ideal solar cells, we don't have ideal um, solar fuel processes. And the question is, can we identify new materials that it will make those technologies either more efficient and lower cost or more durable? And that brings me to sort of the concept of materials design. So one of the big pictures that we want to do is run a computer simulation or set of simulations where the input is the materials property or metric, so combination of properties that we want. And we can run simulations and then we can identify the chemical composition and crystal structure or set of compositions and structures that may yield that target property or metric. So for example, in solar cells, you can think about, we want to have an active absorber layer, of course, that absorbs a lot of sunlight. Usually that's composed of um, available and non-toxic elements and that can give rise to a device that has a high current and voltage. So you can develop a metric for describing what an optimum 
photovoltaic absorber material um, would be. Then we can run simulations and then identify um, some new prospective compounds. And what's rotating on the screen is the crystal structure of kestorite or copper zinc tin sulfide, which is a mineral inspired structure which I've been working on um, for quite a while. So that's the general picture, but beneath the hood, actually, what's running? What do you actually um, run a, sort of behind the scenes in, in, in such a materials design process? And that brings me to sort of computational chemistry, which is sort of my main um, field. And this is the current definition from IUPAC. So they set definitions in chemistry. So what this field is. So it's using mathematical methods for the calculation of chemical properties or for the simulation of molecular materials behavior. And it also includes synthesis planning, database searching and combinatorial library manipulation. So it's quite a wide perspective on what computational chemistry is. And this is a discipline that's been evolving along with the development of computers. And just to put it in perspective, I like this photograph from the 1950s. So this was a state of the art IBM five megabyte hard drive being loaded onto a truck. And of course, these days you take a photograph with your iPhone and it requires more than five megabytes of storage. So memory has really shrunk. But this year has seen the launch of the first commercial quantum computer also from IBM with similar dimensions. So moving from classical to quantum computing, and you may think over the next several decades, actually, is, is quantum computing going to be miniaturized such that we'll have it um, in each household as well? So that's the sort of general intro. And um, so what I want to do in this webinar is essentially two parts. And uh, so the first part is sort of looking at the development of computational chemistry. So how we describe interactions between ions and electrons to predict materials properties. And then in the second part, we look at the future or what's happening now in terms of using the power of data, so materials data and statistics. So the starting point for computational chemistry. So uh, as, as a chemist, we've access to the periodic table, which is a range of different atoms. And we need to have some model of how those atoms interact. And the starting point, you can think of them as classical objects. So you have spheres connected by springs. So the spheres being atoms, the springs being chemical bonds. And you can actually go quite far using molecular mechanics. So treating atoms as classical objects and having some analytic function that describes their interaction. Um, and often in uh, undergraduate studies, so sort of you would come across quite quickly a Leonard Jones type interaction. So from early in the 20th century, so John Leonard Jones was thinking about the interaction of noble gases with the surfaces of a solid. And this is a very typical sort of um, interaction and potential. So you think about having an atom far away from a surface, there's almost no interaction. You bring it closer and closer and closer, then it begins to stabilize, the energy decreases. If you bring it too close, it becomes repulsive. So you get a repulsion between the surface and that atom. Um, and that's described by this uh, R12, R6 potential. And that works for simple cases. And there's many branches of physics where people still use uh, Leonard Jones interactions to describe um, materials properties. But more generally, when we're thinking about complex solids, um, we have to introduce more complex functional forms. So there's wide ranges of two body, three body, four body potentials that can describe complex materials in terms of their structure, and their properties. And the big benefit here, although they look complex, they're analytic functions. So it's quite easy to sum them up, to multiply, to integrate. And so in that sense, in terms of the state of the art, we can now run simulations exceeding 1 billion atoms um, based on molecular mechanics. And this is one really nice example from the literature, is taking a simulation cell of liquid iron, cool the simulation cell, and what you see is the uh, emergence of microstructure. So you see grains forming, you get grain boundaries, you get dislocations. And this all emerges from a very simple interatomic potential, actually developed in part from Mike Finnis, who's a professor in, in the materials department um, at Imperial. So from this very simple two-body potential, you get the emergence of very complex structure. Um, and that's really fascinating. Um, these types of techniques are also useful for any large scale process, for example, radiation damage. 
So you can simulate what happens when you irradiate a material with a particular form of radiation, what defects form, how they propagate. And then that way you can do simulations of nuclear materials and nuclear processes and without actually having to do the experiments in the lab. So that's one big advantage. But generally, I'm more interested in electrons. So in solar cells and in batteries, you have electrons that are whizzing around. So we have to move from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, of course, gets a little bit more difficult. You have to think about the Schrodinger equation or Dirac equation for relativistic systems. But basically, you have some partial differential equation that you need to solve. And it tells you where the electrons are in your material. And then you can also look at the response of the system to different perturbations. So you can get mechanical properties, optical properties. And often the equations can appear quite simple. So in this case here, and we have our Hamiltonian wave function. But in reality, they're impossible to solve exactly for more than one electron. And in many real materials, we're dealing with many millions and billions of electrons that we need to uh, describe. So we need to make approximations. And one of the biggest approximations for materials modeling um, came with density functional theory or DFT. So this is one of the most widely used computational techniques. And probably even if you're not working on the topic, you've come across a publication that uses DFT to predict something. And conceptually, this is a remapping of many body quantum mechanics onto a real space picture. So you have a three dimensional electron density it's easier to describe, it's easier to solve for more complex systems. But there are still bottlenecks. So the underlying algorithm scale order n cubed um, often. And what that means, if we want to simulate a system with 10 times more atoms, so maybe a very complex material, it requires um, a thousand times more computing processing time. So this is sort of introduces a complexity limit that although computers are getting faster, with quantum mechanics, there's a limit in terms of what we can actually calculate in a reasonable amount of time. Although there's a lot of work in computer science trying to lower these bottlenecks. And the second disadvantage of quantum mechanics sometimes can be trying to recover chemical concepts. So in chemistry and physics and material science, we often learn a lot of sort of empirical or heuristic rules that can be quite difficult to extract from this many body quantum mechanical uh, process. So you get many papers published saying, oh, this rule breaks down, this rule um, sort of shouldn't be taught anymore. But often it takes a little bit of thinking to figure out actually, how do you interpret the effective charge of an atom in a crystal? And is that an observable that you could actually measure and can we predict it accurately? So this, there's often many sources of confusion figuring out what we can actually trust or extract from quantum mechanical predictions. But on the positive side, there's a big movement in this field towards freely available software. And this really lowers the barrier of entry for new researchers to start to use these tools. So there's many freely available density functional theory packages. You can, you can go, you can download them, install on your laptop and run some simple calculations. And it gives you access to a very wide range of properties. So DFT is an example of a first principles method. So there's no directly empirical parameters. So you, you can predict the property of the material before it's been made in the lab. You can predict structure, vibrations, thermodynamics, defect processes. So a wide range of properties that are applicable to a wide range of energy technologies. And just to give one example of using, I guess, pushing conventional techniques towards their limit, so Wei Yang in my group recently as part of the Faraday Institution has been working on predicting the thermal transport in complex battery electrodes. So you may or may not know, so inside many of your phones or laptops right now, uh, there are ba lithium batteries containing a material called NMC, which is a mixture between lithium nickel, lithium manganese and lithium, oh, typo, should be lithium cobalt oxide. And you can think about having this ternary uh, phase diagram. So you can have different combinations of those metals. And we're, we're trying to understand how the properties change across that triangle. So beneath this are many hundreds and thousands of calculations that are required to understand how the properties change when you mix together these materials. OK, so that's sort of existing methods. And for the second part of this um, 
webinar wanted to cover actually what's changing in this field. So thinking about machine learning and data. So there's a suggestion right now that we're entering a new paradigm in science, where initially science was based on sort of empirical observations. Then there was an era of model driven science, so the development of thermodynamics and and I guess magnetism, uh, electromagnetism, they're all based on analytic models that sort of could be solved pen and paper. Then over the past um, several decades, we've had sort of a new area, era of computational science. So where digital computers have become powerful in numerically solving equations that we couldn't solve by pen and paper before. Where now we have a new tool emerging where we can start to think about data and using the correlations between data as a tool to discover new knowledge that would, couldn't previously be, be inferred from um, individual experiments or from existing analytic models. And this brings me to machine learning as a general sort of um, topic. So my simple definition of machine learning, sort of to take away sort of some of the scariness, is just statistical algorithms that learn from training data and build a model to make predictions. So it's very similar to what many of us would have been doing in our research as standard, but now we have some new tools to help accelerate the process. And generally machine learning or statistical tools, they're most appropriate where standard methods fail. So if you have a problem, problem that you can solve pen and paper, or you can solve using existing methods, then you should do it. Machine learning is really for the cases where you have so much data that you really need to have a new tool to actually um, decipher what's going on. And um, what I've seen in my field, so where machine learning is being used, so directly related to computational chemistry, so using machine learning to develop faster or better tools. So where something was very expensive to calculate, having a statistical model to make that prediction can save a lot of time. And trying to extract new knowledge from existing data. So using natural language processing, to extract information from published papers is one example. Um, another example is self-driving workflows. So if you can have a computer controlled synthesis and characterization, then you can actually hook that up directly to an optimization algorithm. So you can um, actively sample different combinations of elements or different properties, and then have a cycle where you're trying to train uh, a model and then perhaps optimize a particular set of properties. So there's quite a wide range of applications that are ongoing and machine learning is actually a very broad set of tools. And just to mention a few that you may be familiar with. So regression is, is one branch of machine learning. So where you're trying to predict a value and in, in physical chemistry, for example, this is quite normal. So you, you have a set of data. It might be um, sort of re reaction, so how a reaction progresses versus temperature and pressure, and you need to fit a model to, the, to that data. So you perform regression. And um, classification, you have a set of data and you want to separate it into different categories. And this has been used quite successfully in predicting reaction outcomes. So if you mix together different reagents and the different conditions, can you predict what's going to come out at the end? There's then clustering algorithms where you want to group data by similarity. And this has already been used quite extensively in high throughput, high throughput crystallography. So you're trying to look for interesting regions um, in your data where perhaps you have a new phase emerging um, or something else, um, extended defects, for example, appearing. And then there's reinforcement learning. So this is something that's been adapted from, um, I guess, applications in the gaming industry. So having an algorithm that evolves in, in terms of maximizing a reward. So if you're playing, say, if you're going to play Tetris, maybe you want to maximize the score you get in that game. But if you want to play with molecules, maybe you want to find um, a new mole molecule that's going to interact very strongly with COVID-19, for example. So reinforcement learning has been used a lot in drug design. And if you become interested in machine learning, um, we have many experts actually at Imperial College. Um, and two being uh, two of my colleagues, so Sam Cooper at the Dyson School and David Dye in materials. 
So they were involved in putting together an online course um, on uh, Coursera, so on mathematics for machine learning. So if you want to really get deep into machine learning and understand what's going on behind the scenes, this is a freely available course. And quite amazingly, over 100,000 people have taken this course. So this shows the power of making courses widely available. Um, and the production quality is really, really high. So that's something I would recommend. But what I would say is not everybody is fully on board with machine learning. So I really like this um, comic. So somebody's saying, this is your machine learning system. Yep, so you pour your data into a big pile of linear algebra and you get an answer on the other side. And if you don't get the answer you want, then you just stir the pile of linear algebra. And that's one view of machine learning, that it's a black box, it fits your data, and in, it interpolates a prediction. And that was, it's maybe true of some machine learning studies, but it's something that the community in physical science is very much aware of. And there's a big move now towards having interpretable machine learning models, so you can understand what's going on, but also towards extrapolation instead of just interpolation. So being able to train a model that's going to make some really um, useful predictions instead of just reproducing what you already know. And I think that's going to increase the confidence and also increase the uptake of people using machine learning algorithms. And the big advantage of so many developments in so many fields in maths, in computer science, in physics, in chemistry, in material science, is that we have many available tools to use. And in fact, in, in the materials department, so we used to teach um, MATLAB to undergraduates, and recently that's changed to Python. So undergraduate material scientists learn Python. Um, as they progress through the years, they'll be learning Pandas to deal with data structures and Jupyter Notebooks as a way to keep track of research. And this is increasingly important now when a lot of research has been performed remotely. We have many free libraries for modeling data, so SciPy for sort of standard maths, Scikit-learn for traditional machine learning, and then we have other packages for deep learning for neural nets, and then many packages for making pretty figures, which on one side you could say it's making pretty figures. On the other side, if you have multi-dimensional data sets, how do you actually plot that data effectively? And there are tools like Plotly or Boca that allow you to do that. So you may be able to visually find correlations in your data that you couldn't see otherwise. So I think the day of actually using Excel to read in the output from your infrared measurement and making a simple plot to publish, I think that's ending. I think it's really time to learn how to do programming so you can have a very clean workflows in terms of how you read and process your data and make nice figures at the end. So within my field, um, so I work a lot with crystals and crystallography where you have 230 space groups or different types of symmetries. And at Imperial, actually, there used to be a department of crystallography where students would spend four years just studying the math mathematics of crystallography. But these days, actually, of course, you have some learning to do, but you can download a Python library, for example, SPGLib, and that can perform all of the symmetry analysis that you need. So you can read in a structure, it will tell you all the symmetry operations it contains, for example. Um, so that's how things are changing. So uh, it is my perspective is a lot of these tools are removing a lot of the basic operations so that as scientists and engineers, we can focus on some of the more complex tasks. And it's also enabling open data. So um, making our data more freely available, enabling reproducibility, reuse, and also the ingredients that we need to develop uh, machine learning models. So we need to have a quantity, quality, and diversity of training data. Um, and again, crystal, crystal, crystallographers have been sort of ahead of the game. They have have had community databases for uh, many decades. So the inorganic, uh, the Cambridge Crystal Structure Database has more than 1 million entries now. And they also have a standard format that's human and machine readable. So where you, when you measure or predict the crystal structure, you can make it available in a format that anybody else around the world can read. Um, so that's something that's quite important. In terms of energy technologies, um, one of the limitations initially has been a lack of data. Um, and this is, people are starting to overcome it. So this is from a website 
whoops, powered at the University of Santa Barbara um, in the US. So collecting published data on thermoelectric devices. So you can go to their website, you can play around and plot, um, for example, CBEC coefficient versus thermal conductivity versus um, ZT, which is thermoelectric measurement, thermoelectric metric, and try to look at different correlations in published data. Maybe you'll see particular classes of materials grouped together, and that may give you some insights into pursuing sort of new avenues of research. But in, initially, I think we're at the data collection stage before we develop more or rigorous uh, machine learning models. The same thing is happening from batteries. Um, so the University of Utah is collecting data on published data on batteries in terms of cycle behavior, currents, voltages, and um, lifetime. And again, you can look at different correlations in battery behavior. Um, in, I'm working on batteries, but more closely to my, my field is working on solar cells. And again, there's no community database where you can download the performance of different solar cells in terms of currents and voltages and, and band gaps. So I've been part of an international initiative called the In Emerging Inorganic Solar Cell Efficiency Tables. So this is publishing sort of new records on emerging materials for light to electricity conversion. But as part of this, I'm working on the data side. So trying to develop a community data based data structure where we can um, include information from around the world and again, try to develop models, but also to just to look at correlations. So what systems are doing well, what systems are doing poorly, where should we be paying attention? And so the excitement I think going forward in terms of the materials design angle is that we really understand a very small fraction of chemical space. So if you think of the possible space we have for forming materials, in terms of playing with composition, so mixing elements in different ratios, thinking of structure, so controlling different polymorphs. We can think about stoichiometry, so having defects. Uh, we can think about morphology, so having different facets, for example, can change the catalyt catalytic activity of a material. So this is a very large space, and we're really only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of exploring it. Um, and this is, I guess, really what gets me out of the bed in, in the morning. So exploring new chemical space. So I guess my last word of advice that this is a really good time to start thinking about data. So even if you're not worried about computing things and materials modeling and uh, whatever research you do, you're generally you generate data. So it's a time to think there's this new article, I think just appeared actually this week in, in the ACS weekly magazine. It's a very nice article in terms of thinking how you can curate your research data. They give a sequence of steps and also some links to follow um, in terms of structuring your data. But it's thinking about a, a good way of using this lab downtime um, in terms of thinking about data formats, but also within your research group, how your group shares data um, within the group, but also when you publish a paper, having organized data so you can share it externally. And this is something that can really increase the added value of everything that we publish. OK, so final slide. Um, so I tried to convince you that there are exciting developments in materials modeling and design. And there's sort of this transition going from anal analytical methods to numerical to now statistical. And what we're really limited in the energy domain is available data. And of course, there's lots of data on CO2 and sort of energy production and usage, but more at the fundamental end in terms of materials performance and device construction, that's where we're really lacking right now. So thanks to my wonderful research group, so they're generating a lot of data and ideas. I have quite a large collaboration network and the EFL team, including Connor, and thanks you all, thank you all for your attention. Okay. That was great, Aaron. Thank you very much. And so if you would like to use the Q&A box to submit your questions, um, Aaron will try to get through as many of those as possible in the next um, 20 minutes or so. Yes, yeah, so don't be shy. Uh, I'll just catch my breath again. It's just talking a bit too quickly. But Lisa, I kept the time, got to 30 minutes. OK, so we have a few questions. So, so 
I like questions that are not questions. So one from Alan. So he loves the Excel is dead comment. And I think that's true. Um, and I think I'm as guilty as everybody else, and especially when I was a PhD student at the beginning. Excel is so easy to use. You read in data, you play around for a long time and you get a reasonable figure. But it's so, you'd lose the sort of transparency in your full workflow and how you go from that initial data to the final figure. And there's so many better tools available. And I think even for learning Python and some basic matplotlib, in half a day, you can learn the basic tools to create a decent image. So I think putting that investment in will really increase the value for you as a researcher, but also for future jobs. So many jobs now want people who can, that have some programming skills. And if you say you can use Python, you can use matplotlib, you can use, you've tried one machine learning package that will make you very valuable in the future. Okay. Um, one question for, Yakin, joining all the way from Berlin, which is very kind. Um, so sorry, the question was supposed to follow. Uh, as a more classical scientist standing in the lab, I have the feeling that machine learning really targets at making the observations, draw the conclusions we scientists do know, really trying to mimic our creativity. We probably need to redefine the role of researcher. So where do you see the role of human researchers in the era of machine learning? That's a very philosophical question. And I think in some labs, you really see a big shift where automation is being used a lot. For example, Andy Cooper up in Liverpool, he has some really nice images of the robots zooming around his lab doing synthesis and doing characterization. And I don't think it means that we're out of a job, but I do think that it changes the role of a researcher or it enables us to do new things. Um, I think it definitely means that we need to be teaching undergraduate scientists and engineers new tools. So they need to be learning how to definitely have some basic programming, but also more statistics. So my statistics from my training was relatively weak, and I've, I've had to attend a lot of online webinars and do a lot of reading to bring me up to speed. But I think once you, once you and grasp some of those tools, then that means it opens you up to a wide body of new literature, but also new types of research. But where I think I think things are going in the future, um, I don't think we're out of a job. I think we still have to um, develop good experimental setups to develop, to generate um, data. And ultimately, machine learning just makes approximate predictions. And we do, need, we do need to have direct measurements. So I think experimentalists are definitely still needed. And theorists are definitely needed to develop better models and, and sort of more sophisticated workflows. So at least until we have, I guess, a universal theory of science, which is probably many centuries away, I, I don't think we're going to be out of a job in the future. But I think machine learning can augment, possibly accelerate what we do. So maybe within one PhD, we can do more that would have been possible sort of 10 years ago. Um, I hope that answers a little bit waffly. So Alan is back. So how often does the computer's design material differ in practice versus theory? So how does, feed, how does one feedback this into theory? Any significant successes versus failures? That's a good question. Um, one of the cases where I've been the most impressed um, was when I visited Singapore earlier in January, so just before COVID-19 kicked off. So the, Singapore has been investing a lot in automation. So they, they have quite limited space in terms of research, so they need to be quite smart in what they do. And they were developing this direct automation system where you have computer controlled deposition, where you're dealing with composite materials. And then you have, um, automated measurements of resistivity and Seebeck coefficient. So then they have an automatic loop where they develop a model that's trained directly on their own data. And ultimately they run that for a weekend and automatically they get a prediction of the best composite material that maximizes the metric that they set. So that's a case where you have a self-contained sort of materials optimization workflow. So I think that's sort of, that's good. And the other side, you have then the DFT type predictions that I'm more involved in. And the quality of the predictions really depends on the, I guess, the particular case. 
So we're very good at predicting structure, predicting vibrations. And actually, a lot of my work is bridging theory and experiment. So, for example, predicting neutron scattering signatures and then co collaborating with groups who will go to ISIS um, in Oxford, perform measurements that we can directly overlay the two. And we know exactly where our models are failing. Um, so I think generally the community is very good at benchmarking and trying to train models on very good experimental data. Um, but where things start to get a little bit blurry is if you, you look, for example, at commercial batteries and you cut them open, they're very messy. So you're dealing with nanostructured composites. You're not dealing with pure single crystal materials. So that's where it's quite tricky to build the complexity of reality into the models that we're actually putting together and um, sort of as, as computational scientists. And I think that's where machine learning is proving quite powerful to allow us to simulate more complex processes that wouldn't be possible before. So trying to narrow the bridge between um, what's possible to calculate and then what can actually be measured or what's practical. Okay. Oh, so another question from Anonymous. Can I elaborate on reinforcement learning? Yeah, so this is a topic that's really, I think it came to sort of prominence in, in drug design. And so there's a lot of work in drug design using um, reinforcement learning. And now it's been used in many different contexts, including in material science. So the key point here is that but it depends what you want to do. But one of the predictions I've seen, or one of the processes is trying to predict synthesizability. So if you have a new molecule, how likely is it that it could be synthesized in the lab? Um, and I've seen examples of, of reinforcement learning being used as a process to learn both from existing data, but also there's one really nice case where an app was developed um, where organic chemists would have to use the app then to say, is this molecule plausible or not? And they'd say yes or no. And that would be used to train um, the re reinforcement learning algorithm in terms of what's a viable molecule. Um, so there's many, it's such a, such a broad, um, there's so many broad applications. I guess I won't go too deeply now, but there's many nice review papers in reinforcement learning in chemistry. Okay, another paper from Anonymous. Um, so I mentioned there's a problem of data in materials. Why is it that Google has created a great database of how many aspects of our reality? Yeah, so there's many big databases um, available for many different things. But one of the big problems for materials, um, so I mentioned in crystallography, so there's really good databases for structure, but somehow communities haven't really come together and developed general databases for properties. So there's a lot of really good materials data that's hidden in the literature. So many, many um, properties that are hidden there, the synthesis recipes. So on one side, there's a lot of work with natural language processing to try to extract information from published papers. So to try to develop databases from what's already published. But something else that has to happen is that communities get together and agree that here is a standard where when we publish a paper, we need to have this auxiliary file that contains the relevant information that can be added to a database. And then we can collect all that information together and actually look at correlations. And I think on one side, people have been a little bit lazy in terms of sharing data. Uh, funding bodies are trying to be more strict in telling people you need to make data openly available. And publishers are also being a bit more strict saying you need to have data access statements. But I think when you look at what's being published right now, I think it, we're still a little bit slow and there's a lot of there's a, a lot of work that communities need to do to encourage the building of community databases. OK, next point from Pepe. Oh, thanks for joining Pepe. If it's the Pepe I'm thinking about. So thanks for my talk. Um, so I'm talking about exploring inorganic chemical space. So he's wondering whether I could share my thoughts on effective vectorization of inorganic crystals. Yep, so I think for the past five years, there's been a lot of development and debate on how we represent 
crystalline materials to machine learning algorithms. Um, and what was quickly realized is sort of a typical representation of unit cells and space groups is not very effective, or it's not appropriate for a machine learning algorithm. So we need to have different ways to do it. So you can think about having radial distribution functions and um, many different approaches. But what seems to be, I think, taking the lead now is using graph networks. And there's many really good examples of models for crystalline materials being built from graph networks, in particular combining graph networks with deep learning models that can be very efficient at descri describing um, both the crystal structures, so the macroscopic structures, but also the microscopic coordination environments. So I think graph networks is really the way forward. I know DeepMind uh, over in King's Cross are working a lot on this topic, so they have a physical science division. Um, and they're working on adapting graph networks for materials. But there's also a lot of public libraries already. Um, Isaac is asking, there's some evidence that making black box models more explainable um, over trusting the algorithm um, can lead to something over trusting the algorithm. How do we ensure that explainability and interpretability in machine learning leads to more rigorous and careful use of machine learning? That's a good question, um, and I think interpretability is a really big area right now, and people are figuring out the best way you can interpret interpret trained models, and in particular for deep learning. So you have so many layers, so many coefficients. How do you extract some physics from a trained model like that? And you're seeing many different examples. So in some cases, training a surrogate model. So you have some simpler approximate model that's trained from a more complex model, just to tell you sort of what features are important and what way they're interconnected. And the other examples for for interpretability. Oh, there was something in my head, but it's gone. Um, and knowledge distillation, I think generally is, is, is a big area. So I think the philosophy these days is trying to use the best model you can, but then take advantage of tools to sort of deconstruct those models to see what's happening under the hood. So recently we've been using SHAP analysis, which is one tool to show you the importance of different features in a deep learning model. And it's proved actually really well. So we showed deep, deep learning could reproduce this structure property relationship. But then using SHAP analysis, it showed actually the correlations that, that happen within the trained model, model are very similar to analytic models from the 1960s. So without any bias, we got the right feature relations emerging inside that model. So for me, that was actually really, really impressive. Oh, Sam Cooper, a question from an expert um, over at the Dyson School. Um, so he's asking, do I think that papers that don't share their code and data should be buried alongside Excel? And that's really funny. Um, so I think we're really at this time where you have different generations of research groups. So I think there's some research groups that have very quickly adopted these new methods. And then there's some research groups who have been a little bit slower. And I guess what you don't want to do when you have just a number of policy to say, OK, everything has to be Python and have a clear workflow published. For some groups that have been a little bit slow, and um, they might be cut out. And it might not be the student's fault. It might be the environment. It might be the supervisor or the infrastructure they have access to. Um, so I think it's definitely good to encourage everybody, but I think having hard rules is something that's a little bit tough. So I, I try to be positive, encourage everyone I can, and hopefully if we do it at the undergraduate level, then by the time those students become PhD students or, or, or um, industrial researchers, they'll have that philosophy to help them. Oh, the questions are flooding in. Um, we'll take a, a few more, and then I guess I can try to respond to people it's offline. So Jiho asked how to integrate batteries, thermal effect, life prediction, state estimation from the perspective of machine learning. That's a really good question. <sighs> yeah, so how do you integrate all of these different types of modeling and experiment into one thing? And within the Faraday Institution, so we have a multi-scale modeling team, so a very big project, researchers from across the UK. And we've been together, I guess, about two and a half years. 
there's been a lot of good results, but I guess so far, many groups have worked independently. So I think one of the hopes going forward is that we're going to work together to have a more multi-scale solution. So how we bridge together many different factors. So in batteries, you can use things like ComSol and do a multi-physics model that will incorporate sort of different elements of thermal properties of reactivity. But when you look beneath the hood, it's quite basic, usually physical chemistry and some engineering. Does, we can do a lot better in terms of having a 3D picture and using the latest techniques. But I think currently we can't. And I think it's something we hope to do over the next few years. Um, C asks, since LED materials have a direct band gap, what is the relationship between optical gap of an LED and contact potential turn on voltage of a diode of the same semiconductor? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so obviously, <laughs> my mind is not fresh on, on LEDs right now. Uh, we have been thinking about LEDs, but thinking more in terms of radiative efficiencies. So obviously with an LED and you have a current and you want to convert that into light and any process that's not light is something that's bad. So any recombination, any thermal process. So at least the work we've been doing is trying to calculate non radiative processes. So recombination mediated by defects and that typically can affect the voltages, voltages required. But in terms of the full device, I'm afraid it's not fresh in my head now. But see, if you want to email me, I could try to help um, if it's something that you want some more information on. And then we have somebody joining from the University of Bath. This is quite amazing. So people from across Europe and across the UK. Um, so thanks for my talk. In terms of a clean database, so while maximizing the volume of data, what is the idea of maintaining quality standards? So yeah, now this is a really good question as well. And currently there is a split between on one side having a curated database. So a database where you have a certain set of standards and often somebody physically checks that the data is reasonable. Versus having an open database where anybody can perform an experiment or even make up numbers and submit to a database. And both of those actually exist. So in my community, there's materials project, which is a curated database. And there's Nomad, which is a European sort of community database where anybody can upload data. And there's advantages and disadvantages, obviously curated, more reliable, less data. The one where everybody can upload, you have more data, but it's less reliable. And often if you want to train a model, you need to have many cleaning steps where you're going to filter the bad data. But maybe what you want to see is variability in calculations or measurements and in that case it might be actually quite useful um, so I think there's room for both perhaps room for having a community database with everything but then having very transparent filter steps where you go from a raw database to the curated database that's one way to do it but I'm afraid I don't have a perfect answer um, okay I'm drifting a little bit because I guess I'm getting hungry but let's go, Isaac, another question. Yeah, so his question is about a database for inorganic photovoltaics. What about organic solar cells? Good point. And um, so the group of Alan Asparo Guzik, he had a really nice computer database at Harvard. I think it's down at the moment and he's moving it to Toronto. And that was basically a database of molecular donor and acceptors rather than actually a database of, of um, organic photovoltaic performance or device characteristics. But I'm not aware myself of any database of devices in terms of experimental devices. But I think that would be really, really useful um, if the community got behind it. It may exist already, I'm just not so familiar. Yeah, so a question from Julia. Some more examples of where I've leveraged the latest techniques. I'm, afraid I'm not going. That sort of a, would be a different talk in itself, and I was trying to give a broad perspective. But Julia, if you go to my speaker deck, actually, there's not. They're probably a bit out of date. In future webinars, I'll definitely go more into the actual results, but I, I just don't have time here. I'm afraid. Um, Andres, what advice would I give to new graduates? 
in mechanical engineering where the link is less obvious? And do I think that supplement, supplementary knowledge is a necessity going forward? Yeah, this is the number one question I think that many people have. Uh, many students who are not working on using modeling, but they realize that machine learning is becoming important in their fields, but they don't know where they can possibly use it in their research or PhD. So the question is, actually, what should I do? Um, I think definitely it's worth investing some time just in learning basic processing in terms of Python and plotting, and then having some tests with machine learning, so some basic models. It's, it's not so difficult to learn. The real difficult, most of the time is spelled with Python. Using the machine learning libraries is actually, doesn't take so much time. So I think just getting comfortable with the basic infrastructure, and then a, a problem may come along that you'll be ready to help use these tools to solve. Um, you, you can also list on your CV that you have some additional skills because the reality is not every problem is suitable for these methods, especially if you don't have a lot of data available. If you're in your subfields, there's no public databases, then typically you are a little bit limited. But what you can end up do, doing is fitting some be better curves to the data you have when you publish papers. Um, when you do some tutorials, obviously something might click that may benefit you. So I think there's a lot of added value. Another question, wondering how machine learning can extrapolate a model. So response to the data that's not encapsulated by the distribution of the training set. Yep. So I think one, I guess, naive criticism of machine learning, and naive even I had the same criticism, that I thought it was just sort of fitting data. So you have some data, you fit a curve, and it just basically tells you what you have. But in fact, it's a lot more powerful depending on the features that are used in the training of your model. So in terms of materials, um, so often maybe you have a set of data which is material versus hardness. And you might think, OK, that tells me the hardness of each material. But depending on the feature, what it tells you is that different combinations of local coordinate, coordination environments can give rise to different hardnesses. So then if you construct a new material, which is a different linear combination of coordinations, you can predict the hardness of that material, even though it wasn't in your original data set. And in that way, you're extrapolating to a new material space. So in fact, depending on the model that you fit, often extrapolation works very well. The difficulty and what people are also working on is trying to have error bars. So trying to understand how reliable your prediction actually is. And that's another big area of interest. Um, so from anonymous, can we solve high dimensional partial differential equations such as five or six dimensions using standard finite difference methods? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll be honest, my general numerical methods are not the strongest. But I have read some interesting papers on this one paper. I think it was a bit controversial in nature communications on rediscovering the Navier Stokes equation using machine learning. So problem in fluid dynamics, they had a lot of fluid dynamics data, but they could they could discover that equation. So I think that's that's a good that's a good um, actually I can't remember what how many dimensions they had. Um, if, it, if it was I guess it was 3D. So they must have had at least um, four dimensions, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, David is joined from Dresden. So D David had visited um, a year or so ago as a master's student. Um, so there any suggestions in a general approach to publish data besides classical PDFs or SI? Yeah, so I actually have a, had a longer presentation where you go into sort of how you can publish. So obviously having static PDFs is not the way forward. Um, there are some journals now that specialize in data. For example, scientific data, you can publish data sets. Um, you can use GitHub, for example, to have a repository for your data. You can have something like Zenodo, which is sort of a snapshot of a re repository. But generally in my group, we try now to use Jupyter Notebooks as a way to have transparent workflows combined with data. Uh, I see some I see some group members are better in terms of they use it naturally as part of their research. For other people, it's more of a struggle. So not every paper. 
Um, but I think electronic lab books is the way forward and being able to make them available. But I think we have to appreciate it does take more work to have something that's readable to other people. So we can often do something ourselves, which is quite fast. But if you want to have something that other people can understand, that takes a lot of effort. So we need to give the credit to researchers who make the effort to make everything more transparent. And when they publish a paper, that they actually make the methods more available. But yeah, I think with that, I'm just a little bit out of breath. So I thank everybody for the nice questions. Feel free to email me. And a lot of emails these days, but I will try my best to respond intelligently. Um, Twitter is probably a good place as well if you, if you have a question, um, because it tends to be quite a little bit easier than dealing with um, streams of emails. So yeah. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. That was an excellent um, presentation, really interesting and, and some great um, questions and answers there. And thank you to everyone for, for joining us and for submitting those questions. Um, we do hope you enjoyed the, the session and if you have any feedback, um, do feel free to get in touch. A reminder that our series continues next week and we hope some of you will join us um, at 12 o'clock on Thursday next week when we'll be joined by Andrea Gaon Lombardo from the Electrochemical Science and Engineering Research Group. She'll be speaking about using machine learning to optimize porous electrode microstructures. Um, so hopefully that will be of interest to some of you. Um, and you can find all the details on our website. You can find the details of all of our uh, upcoming webinars and our upcoming events um, on the website. And you will also find, um, if you visit our YouTube page, you'll find our previous webinars. And this uh, webinar will be available um, on YouTube shortly if you'd like to share it with your, your colleagues or students. Um, so that's it for, for today. Thank you very much again for joining us and we'll see you next week. Have a great afternoon.